If you've ever played Settlers of Catan, you understand the value of a good roll of the dice. But just how likely is it to roll a certain number on the dice? Um, how much easier is it to roll an eight compared to a two? That's what we're gonna take a look at in this video. We'll look at how to measure probabilities with the roll of a dice and how to apply those probabilities to make the best decisions in Catan. Now, even if you're not that interested in winning Catan, understanding probability is really important. It helps you make good financial decisions. It helps you succeed in your math class. So watching this video will help you there too. We'll look at some simple and fun ways to understand probability. I'm Jeff with Room to Discover. In this video, we're gonna go through three steps to help you use probability to make better decisions in Settlers of Catan. First, we're gonna go through the basics of probability. What does probability mean? How do we use it in our everyday life? Next, we're gonna look specifically at how to calculate the exact probability of every roll of two dice. And third, we're going to apply that specifically to Catan. We'll look at some scenarios and help you think about where would you place a settlement or build a city in those scenarios. Probability is a way to make predictions about the future. It's a way to measure how likely any event is to take place. We measure probability on a scale from zero to one, where zero is impossible, something that will never happen. One is something that will always happen, something that's inevitable. So for example, I might say that there's about zero probability that my hair will suddenly turn blue. On the other hand, it's almost certain that the sun will rise tomorrow. Now, in reality, most events aren't so clear cut, right? Usually, each event has a certain likelihood somewhere in between zero and one. A common example used to demonstrate probability is the flip of a coin. Here you can see the coin is either gonna come up heads or it's gonna come up tails. And there's about even chance that will come up one way or the other. But since it has to either be heads or tails, we can split this line right down the middle and say, well, half the time it'll come up heads and half the time it will come up tails. As you can see, the basic idea of probability is pretty simple, but probability can get a little bit confusing, partially because there are so many ways to represent the same probabilities. We can represent probability as a ratio, as a fraction, as a decimal, or as a percent. Let's look at another example and see how we could represent this same probability a few different ways. In this example, I've represented the possible outcomes should the Giants encounter the Patriots in the Super Bowl. So what I've done is I've broken our hole up into four sections. And since it's so much more likely that the Giants will win the Super Bowl than the Patriots, I've given the Giants three of those sections and I've given the Patriots one section. So let's see how we would represent this probability each different way. If I were to represent this as a ratio, I would say the Giants have a three to one chance of winning, right? Because for every three times that they win, the Patriots will win once. Now, the interesting thing is that to represent the Patriots' chances of winning, I wouldn't usually just say one to three, though technically that would be correct. Usually, when we're representing the smaller number, we'll take it out of the hole. So we would say the Patriots have a one out of four chance of winning, whereas the Giants have a three to one. To represent that same probability as a fraction, I'll take the total outcomes as my denominator. And for my Giants, it's gonna be three fourths, three fourths of the time the Giants will win, and my Patriots will win one fourth of the time. To represent as a decimal, I simply convert that fraction to a decimal. So each quarter or each fourth is 0 0.25. So 3 fourths converts to 0 0.75. So we would say the Giants would have a 0.75 chance of winning and the Patriots would have a 0 0.25 chance of winning. And what's the easiest conversion is to go from decimal to percent. Percent literally means out of 100 per out of cent hundred. So where we had 75 hundredths or 0 0.75, we simply take those hundredths, make that into a whole number and put the percent sign after, 
and the same thing with our 0.25 converts to a 25% chance. So to find a simple probability, we just take the likelihood of one possible outcome and divide by the total number of outcomes. If we were looking at the roll of a single die, we could just take our number line from zero to one and split it into six equal sections. Each roll is as likely as the next. I'm no more likely to roll a five than a two. So the likelihood of rolling each of these is one out of six or one sixth. So to find the probability when rolling two dice, I have to answer two questions. First, what are the total possible outcomes, right? If I combined all the ways that I could roll one die with all the ways I could roll the other die, how many possible outcomes are there? Then we need to look at each individual outcome within that. How likely is it to roll a, a three? How likely is it to roll an eight? Now at first you might think that it's just as likely, right? If I have two dice, that it might be just as likely to roll a 12 as it is to roll a five, but that's not the case. Let's take a closer look. So since there's gonna be so many possible combinations here, I've created a table to keep track of all our possible rolls. Each column represents one number that can come up on the purple die, and each row represents one number that comes up on the red die. So let's start by looking at our row of one, right? If we roll a one on the red die, what are all our possible outcomes? So all I need to do is add one to each of these purple rolls, and I can see that I can get anything from two through seven when I roll a one on my red die. Let's take a look at our next row. So when I roll a two on my red die, I'm adding two to all of the possible outcomes on my purple die. Um, as you can see, we've already lost two. There's no way to get a two in our second row. And we've added a new number on this side, eight to our possibilities. So in our third row, we add three to each value. We can get anything from four through nine. Now you may have noticed that there's a pattern starting to form. I have these diagonal lines going down of the same value, right? Let's see what that means when we fill in the rest of our chart. So when we fill in our complete table, we can see that that pattern continues. All of our numbers are represented on a diagonal line going across. What that means is that the large rolls and small rolls are on the edges, they have a shorter line and thus fewer possibilities, right? We can only get two one way. We can only get 12 one way. Whereas seven, which goes right across the middle, has the longest line and the most possible ways to make it, right? We can make a seven by rolling a six and a one. We can also mirror that and do six and one with six on red and one on purple. We can do a two and a five a three and a four, and we can flip all the ways, all of those around. So there are six ways to make seven. So if you ever wonder why the robber comes up so often, that's why seven is the most likely number to come up on a roll of two dice. So to figure out the probabilities of each outcome, we're gonna start by finding the total possible rolls. One way to do that is just to count up all these boxes or as a shortcut, we can represent the total possible outcomes as six times six. Uh, combinations is actually the, the fifth meaning of multiplication. Uh, we'll have another video coming out going into more detail um, on the five meanings of multiplication. But just for short, um, when we're combining two events, right, like six possible rolls this way, six possible rolls that way, we find our total just by multiplying the two together. So each of our possible rolls are going to be a probability out of 36. And as we already mentioned, two and 12 only have one way to come up. So our probability of rolling a two is one out of 36, the same as our probability of rolling a 12. Now there are two different ways that we can make three and two different ways we can make 11. So each of those are a probability of two out of 36 that can be reduced to one out of 18. What that means is on average, it's going to take 18 rolls before we get an 11, or 18 rolls before we come up with a three. Much better than 36, but still 
we shouldn't expect to see these numbers come up very often. Now we'll roll a 10 three times out of every 36, same with rolling a four, which reduces to one out of 12. Our nines and our fives can come four different ways. So that's gonna reduce to one out of nine, right? One out of every nine rolls should be a nine and one out of nine rolls uh, should also be a five. Not incredibly likely, but still so much more likely than one out of 36. And the best spots on the board are our eights and our sixes. There are full five different ways to make each of those. So if you've ever wondered why those numbers are red and the rest are in black, that's because they're so much more likely to come up. Um, now five out of 36 doesn't exactly reduce, but it's pretty close to one seventh. So imagine every seven rolls, you're gonna get an eight, every seven rolls, you're going to get a six. And finally, our seven. You can't get a resource with a seven on it. It's just too powerful. It's probably why it's reserved for the robber. Um, but our odds here are six out of 36 or one out of six. So if you're playing a three player game, um, every two rounds on average, you'll come up with one seven. So now let's look at how to use these probabilities to make the best decisions when you're playing Catan. So, so to think about how we're going to make decisions, I've taken a screenshot from Catan Universe. It's an online version of Catan. Um, and let's just start, let's, let's consider this spot right here. This spot gives me a four, an eight, and a three. So our eight's gonna come up five times out of every 36. Our three is gonna come up two times out of 36. And our four is gonna come up three times out of 36. So five plus two plus three, that gives us 10. So the value of that space would be 10 out of 36. I could reduce that to five out of 18. And let's say this is about equivalent to one out of four. So if I choose this space, I'm going to get a resource about one out of every four rolls. So let's look at another possible space. How about that one? Okay, here we have a nine, a five, and a 10. Now our nine is going to come up four times out of 36, as is our five, and our 10 is gonna come up three times. So if we add that together, that gives us 11. Okay, so 11 out of 36 is not quite one out of three, but it's it's almost one out of three, whereas our last location was close to one out of four. Now, both of those spots were moderately successful. Let's see what happens when we choose a spot that's just a really bad spot. Okay, so this spot over here, not only is it on the desert, right, which is basically not going to give us anything, um, we've got a, a five and we have a two. Our five is gonna come up four times out of 36. Our two is gonna come up one time. So that's gonna give us five out of 36. That's gonna be less than one out of every seven rolls, right? So whereas the others were one out of three, one out of four, um, those are twice as good or more than twice as good. They're gonna, they're gonna give us resources almost twice as much. Um, so that's why it's so um, bad you don't wanna be near the desert, you wanna stay away from twos. So using that point system to measure the probability of getting resources from a certain spot is really useful. It's gonna help you maximize the resources you get, make really good decisions for your opening settlements and also where you're gonna build or upgrade. But it's not the only consideration. Um, if I picked this spot, for example, it has a good score, right? Um, 10 out of 36 is gonna be my probability, but maybe I don't really want sheep and ore. Maybe that's not what I need the most. Or this spot has a good score, but when I choose to build next, I'm looking at getting next to a desert or you know places along the coast that are gonna have fewer points. Uh, this spot, on the other hand, is pretty diversified. I get wheat, I get bricks, I get sheep. And as a bonus, um, I can easily put a settlement here, and a settlement here would also bring 
um, a lot of resources and I can trade all that wheat in to get whatever I want. So the flexibility is an option in terms of um, what resources you need and also thinking moves ahead. Calculating the probabilities for that would be really, really complicated, but a, a computer AI that was playing against you would probably factor the probabilities of all those other situations. How likely am I to build here next? How likely is my next settlement going to um, bring resources? But even just doing that initial step of calculating the probability of your starting settlements um, is going to make a huge difference in your game. Thank you for watching. I hope this video is going to help you understand probability and also make you a better Catan player. Uh, if you enjoyed it, please like and don't forget to subscribe to our channel. If you're interested in more ways to make math simple and fun, visit roomtodiscover.com slash online. There you'll find lesson plans, blog posts, videos, uh, really designed to uh, spice up the math classroom. So uh, thanks again for watching and have a great day.